On Friday, I'm going to be heading out of town. While a post-High Holy Day beach vacation sounds nice right about now, I'm actually just making a quick trip home to Wyoming, Ohio. Wyoming is a town of about 8,000 people located just a little north of the city of Cincinnati. It's the place where I was born and raised. And this weekend, I will be going there to celebrate my 20th high school reunion. I can hardly believe that that much time has passed. But when I look back and think about the experience, I have such fond memories of the people, of course. We were a small but diverse group of a little less than 100 students. While we all started at different elementary schools, by fourth grade, we were all together through our senior year. So these are literally people that I grew up with. I also just have fond memories of the high school experience. In Wyoming, high school football is basically a religion. So I remember all the games, the homecomings, the spirit days, all filled with such cowboy pride and enthusiasm. At the time, I may not have appreciated it, but now I also look back with gratitude as I think about the education I received. I was lucky to learn from dedicated teachers and to have had the opportunity to select from an array of classes. Though I have to say, there is one that I could have done without, calculus. For whatever reason, I just could not figure it out. I went to class, I studied, I got help. No matter what I did, I just didn't get it. I still remember the way I felt before one final. I had stayed up all night studying and I was still sure that I was going to fail. So I put the book under my pillow that night, hoping that somehow the information would get to me through osmosis. Shockingly, that didn't work. I was so nervous when I got to the class, but right then, as the teacher was about to pass out the test, I did what any other teenager who would later go on to be a rabbi would do. I took a deep breath, I closed my eyes, and I said, dear God, please help me pass this test. <laughs> so did I pass? The truth of the matter is that I don't even remember. All I know is that when I was in a tough spot, my instinct was to pray. Certainly there could have been other more serious moments when I was moved to do the same thing. I could be wrong, but I think this is something that almost everyone has done at some point in time. Even if you don't consider yourself a prayer person, there's probably been an instant when you've released a dear God or a please God. You find yourself in a desperate situation and you spontaneously turn to God. There was an influential rabbi known as Nachmanides who lived in the 13th century. He believed that this is exactly when we should pray. When we are in distress or dire straits, we should open up our hearts and cry out for help. Some people call this praying in a foxhole. It's reserved for the difficult moments in our own lives. But we can also be moved to pray in this manner when we see others around us in a difficult spot. Unfortunately, when we look around the world, we see so many who are in this very state. There are people who live under the rule of oppression and violence. There are Jews in Europe and abroad who constantly face the threats of anti-Semitism. There are Israelis who live in a state of alert waiting for the next rocket to be launched in their direction. I don't have to tell you that there are problems in our own country and our own communities. Just to the south of us, there are the sounds of shootings. Throughout our area, there are the cries of those who don't have enough to eat. And in our homes and those of our neighbors, there are struggles between spouses, between parents and children. There is the loss of jobs and the loss of loved ones. And there is just so much illness. From last Yom Kippur to this, so many of us have been confronted with challenging diagnoses. So many people that we love and care about. I know that there are those that I hold so close to my heart who have heard news this year that they never wanted to hear. News that we never wanted to hear. When this happens, we want them to know that we are there for them. So we check in and send gifts and bring meals. This can be so helpful. But so often in these situations, even people who don't usually pray 
will ask for prayers. They think that the prayers may help or at the very least they won't hurt. And so we pray for them. Recently, a dear friend my age was diagnosed with breast cancer. Since the moment she received the news, she has maintained the most incredible outlook and attitude. She has also inspired so many young women to get mammograms and get tested for the BRCA gene. But to fight the cancer, she's been receiving an aggressive form of chemo that can leave her feeling quite sick. One Friday following her treatment, I found myself praying for her at services, for her health and strength, and for the courage of her family. Afterwards, I sent her a message to let her know I had been thinking of her and was sending healing prayers her way. I'm sure I even included one of my most used emojis, the two hands in prayer. I didn't hear from her until later the next day, but here is what she said, and I share this with her permission, of course. Your Shabbat prayers made me feel better, finally feeling like myself today. Enjoy the whole day outside with very little rest. Keep the prayers coming. I was so encouraged by this, and so I have continued to pray for this friend and other loved ones and so many of you who have been facing challenges. I think that I may have prayed more this year than in any other year in the past. But I have to admit that lately, I've been a little self-conscious about letting people know I'm sending my thoughts and prayers their way. I know I'm a rabbi, so it wouldn't be unusual if I told you I was praying for you. However, in the last year or so, this phrase, sending thoughts and prayers, has become quite controversial. You've probably seen this, especially if you're on Twitter, when after a catastrophic event like a school shooting or a devastating storm, hashtag thoughts and prayers immediately starts trending. This is because in the aftermath, it's become commonplace for individuals to send thoughts and prayers to the victims and their families. Whether they mean it or not, we don't know, but many people now find this phrase useless and even offensive they think, what can thoughts and prayers actually do? We don't need them. What we need is action. Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson, Dean of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies, has also noticed this phenomenon. Recently, he wrote an article in the Jewish Journal that said there is a tidal wave of reaction against praying in these violent and troubling times. And in, there is indeed a biblical basis for that reaction. We are told that when Moses witnessed the Egyptian army assaulting the newly liberated Israelites huddled by the shores of the sea, God told Moses the very same thing. Now is not the time for prayer. Do something, take action, lead. Et la asot. This is the time to act on God's behalf. So this begs the question, do we still need prayer in the times that we're living in? Might we be better off putting all our energy into action? Thousands of years ago, our people didn't pray like we do now. When they wanted to connect with God, they would bring sacrifices to the temple. They would take the best animals they could find and offer them as gifts for God. The hope is that, these, that God would accept these and in turn bless them with wealth and health and protection. But once the temple was destroyed, we still wanted to ask God for these blessings. So we began bringing the offerings of our hearts, our prayers as we know them today. But I think we all know that just because we ask God for these blessings doesn't mean that they're going to be granted. If only we could pray and know that our prayers would be heard and answered. In the book, Making Prayer Real, it says that we often are, expect our prayers to be like a vending machine experience. We decide what we want and we wait for it to happen. That would be nice, but it doesn't work like this. Unfortunately, we all know people who have prayed and prayed only to meet a disappointing or even harsh outcome. And perhaps this has even happened to us personally. The knowledge of this alone could make us wanna stop praying. It makes us wonder what's the point? 
However, when I think like this, I always, come, I always end up coming back to those who lived through the Holocaust. How is it that survivors were able to keep praying after experiencing such trials and witnessing such horror? This is actually a question that Elie Wiesel of Blessed Memory would often ask. In a lecture he gave years ago in New York City, he addressed the topic. He told a story of a survivor who tries to pray every day. But when he gets to the prayer that says, Ahava Raba Ahav Tanu, which means you have loved us very much, O Lord, he must stop after what he has lived through. How can he speak to God about God's love? And more than that, how can he ask God to bless him with mercy and kindness? Wiesel asked, how can one say these words? words that have been denied before our own eyes. So the man could stop right there, he could be done with prayer, but he continues and he says the words that the generations before him said. He says the words that he said as an innocent child. He says the words that were recited in the camps and he says them now. Because according to Wiesel, and this is contrary to what many others believe, one can live without hope, and one can live without truth, but one cannot live without prayer. The poet Judah Halevi, who lived long before Wiesel, agreed with this sentiment. He said that prayer is to the soul what food is to the body. Without prayer, something within us atrophies and dies. It is possible to have a life without prayer, just as it's possible to have a life without music or love or laughter, but it is a diminished thing, missing whole dimensions of experience. It is the act of prayer that gives meaning and purpose to our lives. So clearly we still need prayer today. But let's be honest, praying can be hard. I've had many people tell me that they don't know how to pray or what they're supposed to do or say when they pray. Yet it might not be as complicated as we think. And I know this because in Hebrew, the verb to pray is lehit palel. It's reflexive, meaning something we do to ourselves. So in this case, it actually means to think about oneself. This is what it really means to pray. And this day, Yom Kippur calls upon us to do this exact thing. While we can ask God to hear us and to give us guidance, Prayer actually depends on us. We have to put in the time and really examine our lives. In her book, Talking to God, Rabbi Naomi Levy says that prayer forces us to become intimately acquainted with our own souls. When we do this, there's always the possibility that we won't like what we find. When we pray, it's hard to hide from ourselves. We have to acknowledge our shortcomings and mistakes, as well as our disappointments and fears. This is difficult, but it is also such an opportunity because it gives us the motivation to work so that we can become the best versions of ourselves. Our prayers can lead us to growth and change. And while prayer requires us to work on ourselves, it doesn't mean that we have to go at it alone. There is something so transformational that happens when we come together to pray. Come on, you didn't think I was going to give a sermon on prayer without making a pitch for you to come back here for more. Honestly, there is comfort in coming to temple and gathering together in prayer. It connects us to God and to the generations who have come before us and those that will come after us and the community that surrounds us right now. It is a constant reminder that none of us are alone on this journey. We are all part of something larger, and this means that we have a responsibility to one another. When members of our community have joys to celebrate, we get to be there to share in their happiness, just as when others are in pain and struggling. We need to be there to help carry their burden. One way that we can support each other is by reaching out and lifting one another up through prayer. Prayer gives us the chance to strengthen one another as well as the entire world around us. 
In one of my favorite teachings from the Talmud, we are taught that when we pray, we should always try to do it in a room with windows. This isn't just for the light and a nice view. The windows encourage us to look beyond ourselves and take note of the world around us. When we do this, I think that we will see all the blessings that abound. Yet when we look out, I am sure we will notice that this world is far from perfect. There is pain and violence and illness and so many other troubles that we wish we could banish with our thoughts and prayers. But we cannot stop praying. We must always remember that our prayers have power. They give us clarity and vision that we need so that we can be moved to take action. Instead of waiting for our prayers to be answered, we can begin to work towards finding solutions for all of the challenges that exist around us. And then we can begin healing this very fractured world. So as we move forward from this holy day, I hope that we will continue to open our hearts, look within them, and offer the prayers that come from deep within. Let us pray for ourselves and our families. Let us pray for our community and our world. Let us pray for hope and healing. Let us pray for strength and resilience. Let us pray for goodness and blessings. And let us pray not just that we will be heard or that our prayers will be answered, but that we will be inspired to work together as God's partners to bring wholeness and peace to every person in every place at every moment. Kenya Hiratson, dear God, may this be your will. <laughs>